Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, uh, webinar, which is being run by the Campaign for Social Science. Um, my name's Rick Muir. I'm director of the Police Foundation. We're an independent think tank that uh, carries out research and improving policing. Um, as you may know, the Campaign for Social Science um, aims to demonstrate how social science can improve public policy, society, and all of our lives. Um, it highlights the value of social science research and advocates for its greater use in decision making and in government. And in today's seminar, we're going to be talking about rebuilding trust in the police. We know that across um, Western nations, um, trust in public institutions has been falling, including in the police. And in the UK in particular, we've had a number of very high profile stories and scandals, particularly uh, facing the Metropolitan Police, but not exclusively the Metropolitan Police, which have damaged the public's relationship uh, with the police. It's pretty clear if you look at the surveys that um, trust and confidence in the police has fallen uh, in the last few years. The police also, of course, face significant restrictions on their funding. We've been coming out of a major period of austerity. Um, the police are facing more complex demands on their uh, time. Uh, and uh, they have to balance between different priorities, uh, and that has also um, affected their relationship with the public. It means that they're not always able to get out to respond to calls as quickly as they might. They don't all, aren't always able to investigate all the crimes that the public uh, report to them. Uh, so what we want to try and do with this panel is to examine some of these challenges and identify some potential solutions. So we're going to uh, hear from two excellent uh, panelists. Uh, Professor Jyoti Balur and Professor Martin Innes, who are each going to give a, um, a presentation and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A uh, with all of you. Um, so uh, please do use the Q&A function uh, and you can just throughout the seminar just put questions in there uh, and we'll, after the presentations are finished, we'll then um, uh, move to those questions. So just briefly by way of introduction, Professor Jyoti Balur is Professor of Policing in the Department of Security and Crime Science at UCL. She served in the Indian Police Service before obtaining her PhD at the London School of Economics and joining UCL as Professor of Policing. Martin Innes is co-director of the Security, Crime and Intelligence Innovation Institute and a professor in the School of Social Sciences, the Sciences at Cardiff University. Um, he's done work in a whole range of themes, including disinformation, counterterrorism, neighborhood policing, signal crimes, and murder investigations, which has been influential both in the UK and globally. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, we'll turn to our um, presenters. So first of all, um, Jyoti, would you like to start, please? Thanks, Rick. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me just share my screen. So today we are talking about rebuilding trust in the police. and. We're talking about two challenges that the police are facing, um, not just in the UK, but world over. Severe pressure on resources and falling public trust. Now, the way the police have tried to address the resource crunch crisis is by emphasizing um, on technological solutions to policing problems. So uh, the emphasis on policing research and development and the direction of travel for most police organizations the world over is to find solutions to policing challenges in big data, AI, predictive models and algorithms. And, and whatever resources are there are uh, being poured into finding better solutions to be smarter in their policing attitudes. And there is a belief that this would fill the resource gap. And this is probably absolutely right and the right direction of travel. Uh, the problem I have with this is um, a, a slight inability or reluctance to examine more critically whether or how these solutions might actually be perpetuating, if not in some cases worsening, existing inequalities and um, resulting in worst outcomes for certain sections of society. Um, an algorithm is only as good as the data that's fed that goes into its, its making. And um, evidence has indicated that this can often be problematic and inequitable in nature. But we'll return to that in a minute. Um, the solution, on the other hand, to, sorry, 
to the public trust crisis is is this belief um, uh, that um, you know increased effectiveness is is anchored in the legitimacy of policing. So the more effective the police are going to be, the more legitimate they're going to be considered. The more legitimate there are, they are, it will automatically improve public trust. Um, these are those rationalized myths in the organization, which makes it think that this is how we should be functioning and um, you know, give an appearance of objectivity in decision making. And that itself, you know, it's not us making decisions, it's the algorithm or the data. And that sort of will address some of the concerns of bias and racism. Now, there seems to be a bit of a fallacy in this thinking. It's almost as if, to me, it appears as if the police think technological solutions will lead to get greater effectiveness. And somehow, through increasing legitimacy of the police, will improve public trust. What they're not really doing is identifying the actual initial cause of this lack of public trust or reduction in public trust. Because, you know, a theory of change approach says if you identify a cause, you find the appropriate intervention and ensure that your desired outcome is achieved. Now, all the inputs and outputs by way of technological solutions are supposed to somehow magically lead to the outcome of increased public trust. But the mechanism by which this this should happen has not really, I think, been thought through. What we need to do really is to go and look at what are the causes of some of this public distrust emanating from these high profile stories and scandals that, that Rick was referring to. And, and, you know, these are factors that have been identified in the Casey report um, most recently, but have co constantly been coming up as problems with the police. Institutional racism, sexism, misogyny, corruption, lack of integrity, cronyism. Um, we do know that the culture uh, dominates not just what behavior is currently being practiced, but also what might be acceptable by the organization. Culture is not static. It is constantly uh, uh, emerging. Um, and, and it, it dominates the behavior of the police. And it's this behavior of the police that the public are unhappy about or are dissatisfied with. So this public dissatisfaction or lack of trust is not so much rooted in public inefficiency as in their attitudes and behaviors towards the police. Unfortunately, the police response to most of these high profile stories are denial. Denial in the classical sense, um, as, as expressed by Cohen in, in the interpretive sense, um, you know, the, the, the commissioner came back and said, it isn't institutional racism and denial in the implicatory sense of this is institutionally problematic. In fact, there seems to be a refuge in explaining some of this problematic behavior in some version of rotten apples and rotten barrels, which, which continues despite being, um, being um, you know, critical, criticized earlier. These, these kind of explanations continue to be put forward. A lot of that reputation management that organizations are currently involved in are embedded in solutions to give this appearance of objectivity and, and some sort of appearance that police discretion through socio-technical solutions is being restricted. I think, and this is where we come to what are the solutions there, so I think that policing should be more community or people focused. I think that's something that maybe, maybe Martin will talk about a bit more. And also that policing should be more procedurally just. Now, procedural justice um, might address most of these concerns, but it requires a culture change. Um, Evidence indicates that the ethos of procedural justice cannot be transmitted merely through a two-day training program and cannot be layered on top of business as usual. These principles need to be sustained and nourished by organizational culture and values that, that, that 
um, that are not just merely instrumental, but are seen as ends in themselves. Related to and interconnected with principles of procedural justice is the concept of organizational justice, whereby officers perceive themselves as being treated fairly by the organization, which in turn will, will improve their job satisfaction, their commitment to trust and transparency, and also their self-legitimacy. This link between internal organizational climate and behaviors with their external expression in in their relationship with the community has been discussed in the organizational change and policing literature. But not many police organizations and senior leadership teams are committed to engendering organizational justice. A few attempts have been made in the UK and with varying degrees of success, but have quickly faded away under the twin threats of inadequate resources as always due to the demands of routine policing and a change in leadership and policing priorities. So I'm sort of, I'm suggesting that you need to initiate culture change if you want to improve public trust and improve pub policing behavior. By, by greater organizational justice, which is inward facing, um, will support embedding procedural justice principles um, in the outward facing behaviors towards the public. And this has a better chance of improving public trust. Unfortunately, we need to talk about culture. But the question is, does culture exist? Is it dead? What worries me is that the police are not just denying that there are fundamental problems in how they are operating as an organization, but that in doing so, they are refusing to focus inwards on identifying what's going wrong within the organization. There are inherent issues with the prevailing culture, something that has been identified over 60 years ago by policing scholars. But it seems as if using the lens of culture is no longer flavor of the month. I think we need to revive some of the age old questions that have been pushed into the background. There is very little research done on police culture recently and whatever there is, only concludes that it is well and it is alive and it is existing. And yet little is being done to address how to reform or transform it. I fret that talking about culture is considered too old school and there's almost an impatience uh, amongst researchers and practitioners and they want to move on to more exciting concepts and solutions, sort of data-driven, AI-driven solutions. And they have their place and a very important place at that. But whether they are the solution to the problem of falling public trust, I am not so convinced. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Really interesting presentation and lots, lots for us to uh, discuss uh, um, in a moment. So thank you very much for that. Um, Martin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you, Giotti, and thank you to everybody who's joined online for sort of giving up your lunch break. Um, so, um, in starting to try and think about these kind of issues, I thought it's kind of helpful to divide up um, thinking about our diagnosis of what the problem is, and then to move on to think in terms of potential treatments. And in terms of my perspective on these issues, I thought I'd draw in um, three different strands of the work that I've been involved in uh, over the years. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about disinformation and, and its role. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some work I did on um, a new concept uh, called signal crimes that helps us, I think, unpick the ways in which members of the public understand and attribute meaning to uh, issues of crime and policing. And then as I move into talking more about the treatment of, uh, of these things and what we might do about things, um, I'll talk about some work that I was involved in in relation to neighbourhood policing back in the early 2000s. Um, so a few kind of scene setting contextual kind of um, remarks. Um, as Rick outlined in his, uh, in his introduction, uh, the um, Problems that the police are experiencing in relation to trust are you not not unique to the institution of policing. They are common and being felt across a range of public institutions 
And we're seeing fairly similar patterns, albeit with some variations across different countries as, as well. So it's probably worth just um, at that point then thinking about, well, when, when we talk about trust and the problems with trust, what is it that we're talking about? And I'm quite taken with the distinction that sometimes you drawn between vertical trust and horizontal trust. So vertical trust, the connections between individuals and institutions, and then horizontal trust, uh, the relationships that occur um, across communities, groups and individuals at a, at a similar kind of level of strata in, in, in society. And both of these are um, important in terms of how we think about the relationship between the police, the public and issues of, of trust. A second point, I think, in context setting is that, of course, trust is easier to corrode than it is to build. And I think that's always really important to remember. And then the third um, kind of scene setting remark, really, um, is, is to try and put these into a bit of a longer view and, and just to remember that um, historically, it has always been the case that not everybody has trusted the police. And there have been um, quite a number of groups and communities within society who have felt deeply distrustful um, over an extended period of time. Um, so that really is, is where I want to start with in that in many ways, these kind of problems are not necessarily new. And even the idea that um, levels of public trust may be being impacted by issues of disinformation and misinformation are not new. In fact, the term misinformation, the earliest record we found of it is, is going back to 1601 in the context of the English Civil War and the extent to which um, people were mistrustful of the communications coming from the government and the authorities in the context of social conflict. And of course, that is part of the role of the police service is to deal with social conflicts of different types and of different scales and in, in, in different um, manners. What is unique about disinformation um, and misinformation at the moment is the technological and information environment in, in which it's operating, which allows it to travel further and faster. And um, these issues have obviously been brought to the fore by um, uh, the, the kind of events over the summer in relation to the riots that took place across England and Wales. But in some ways, again, I want to make that kind of historical connection and say, these are not new problems for policing. Disinformation as a cause of um, uh, civil unrest and public order has a long, long track record going back. And in, indeed, one of the pieces of work that I did um, in the early um, 2000s was a, a study of a riot that happened in Birmingham. Um, and it just strikes me, or it has struck me recently, looking at the events uh, following the tragedies in Southport, is just how similar the social dynamics of the riot that I was looking at in about 2003, 2004 in Birmingham are, are to what we saw this summer. In the, in the previous case that I was looking at, um, this historical case, um, there were false claims made of a rape that had taken place. Um, these claims bubbled away in the community for a period of time before they suddenly kind of caught the attention of everybody and then acted as a trigger um, for, for, for social disorder. And part of that was the um, difficulty that the police found in being able to con control the information environment and control the stories that were circling within and across and between different communities who are getting into a more antagonistic and more adversarial relationship with each other. And when I was doing this 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 particular study of it, I, I, I was really engaged in trying to um, rethink the ways in which we as analysts and social scientists try to understand how the public makes sense of crime and policing issues. And the reason I was, was interested in that is I was just struck by how much of the public and political discourse about crime and policing is based upon very aggregate trend measures. So the discourse, are there more or fewer police officers than there used to be? 
is there more or less crime um, than uh, the, the, there was in the past? And I don't think that was, I didn't think that is how people make sense of these kind of issues. I don't think it's how people understand them. And it's certainly not how people attribute meaning uh, to, to, to different crime and disorder and policing kind of issues. So instead, I came up with this idea of there being things that happen in the world, events, moments that I refer to as signal crimes. And, and the basic premise that I was operating at was um, a signal crime is an event that changes how people think, feel or act in relation to their security, either at a personal or a collective level. Um, and so rather than thinking in terms of aggregate crime rates or numbers of police officers overall, I just thought it was mu made much more sense to try and look at what are the events that send signals to people that help them interpret their environment and how safe they feel. And I would like to kind of suggest um, with, with, within the context of this webinar that actually that idea of there being these signal crimes or signal events um, absolutely helps us interpret and understand why these particular scandals and crises in policing are registering and are so resonant with so many people because what they demonstrate or evidence is a sense in which social control is provided by the police is failing them, is not there, is ineffective, or is not being delivered in an appropriate kind of manner. Um, and it's that, I think, that helps us understand how or why these kind of events and these kind of moments are having such an impact upon levels of trust. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. And in some ways, again, taking this slightly longer historical view, we've been here before. In the early 2000s, um, I was approached to try and help um, a number of senior police officers grapple with what at the time they were referring to as the reassurance gap. So um, when they talked about a reassurance gap, what they were referring to is that um, levels of crime at the time were, were declining and had been falling for, for, for several years. But in terms of how people felt and their safety, um, they didn't believe that this was the case. They didn't trust the crime statistics and they didn't trust police officers coming along and telling them that they were actually objectively, in terms of the statistics and data available, safer than they had been in the past. So I was commissioned to lead a research team um, and what we ended up doing was inventing and testing um, some of the core processes and systems that became neighbourhood policing that was rolled out uh, uh, across the country. And, and one of the critical things we were able to do in this piece of work was to actually design and test what innovations in police practice delivered. So what we were able to do is, if you have a um, well-designed form of community policing, what effects does it have upon communities and, and groups? And we were able to demonstrate through a quasi-experimental study that you can actually shift levels of public trust and confidence in a positive manner if you deliver policing in the right way. So what was it that we did in terms of trying to deliver policing in the right way? We had kind of three principles. First principle was policing needs to be visible, accessible and familiar. Um, visibility matters in giving people a reason to think that their safety is being protected. You can have good visibility and bad visibility, but visibility does does matter. And, and you can't do this all uh, remotely and away from people. There needs to be a kind of a boots on the ground level of, of presence. Accessible, people have to be able to contact the police and re re relay their concerns and their issues with them. And then also a degree of familiarity um, by which we, we, we were quite keen um, to um, make sure that there was a sense of interconnection between police officers and the communities that they were serving. Um, and that really matters. 
Um, one of the problems with the response model of policing is officers turn up, deal with an incident, go away, and then there'd be another part of the city or another part of the town. What we were trying to do was to kind of say, what you actually want is police officers who know that if they come and deal with an incident today, they will have to deal with whatever happens in a week's time as a consequence of it, because they're going to be policing the same patch, the same bit of territory, the same people. So visibility, accessibility and familiarity were really important. The second idea that we had was to target um, uh, signal crimes and signal disorders. Find out what are the issues that are changing how people think, feel or act in their local area and do something about them. And then the third um, element of this was to do it in a co-productive kind of manner. So the point of neighbourhood policing was not just for the police to come along and solve all of the community's problems, because you can never do that. But it was to come along, help communities identify what matters most to them, help them do something about that in order that levels of social cohesion, community cohesion and other pro-social forces would grow over time. So that was, if you like, the, the, the broad schema that, that we were operating on. And, and one of the things that I think um, got lost in a lot of the conversation about um, uh, this version of community policing was just how much it relied upon social scientific research and concepts. Um, the approach that we adopted was very, very heavily influenced by the Chicago School of Sociology and the idea that you can undertake what, what tends to get referred to as systematic social observation. So very carefully calibrated surveying and observations of communities in order to identify at a very, very local level what it is that matters most and doing something about them. And then the second area of, of social science research that I think was really critical in, in, in terms of what we were, were doing was the integration of behavioural science kind of principles and the idea that what we were trying to do was help the police engineer more positive public relations. So one of the key um, illustrations of this, if you like, was we said to the police, pretty much in all modalities, you rely on the public coming and telling you what their problems are. What happens if we change that dynamic and say part of the neighbourhood policing mission is to go out proactively and not be told what's happening, but go and find out from people and ask them proactively what matters to you in your neighbourhood and in your local area. And those are kind of the kind of principles that, that we know work from, from, from behavioural science. And as a result of this, and, and quite a lot of um, work, we had you know, a number of really, really interesting indicators along the way that things were, were working. Um, the first indicator that we, we kind of picked up was actually in, in some of the work that we were doing in the Met, is we noticed um, members of the community that we were engaging with and we were working with started to make a difference in how they were talking about policing. They were talking about our police and the Met. The Met was the institution that you know was a big behemoth that they didn't necessarily kind of like everything it did. Our police were the local police officers and they were all right because they were working on side with us. So we thought that was a really kind of um, good indicator. Another indicator of, of success um, was that we noticed when we started to ask people about the areas where they were concerned about crime and disorder, they shifted over time. So as neighbourhood policing took effect, where previously people had been talking about problems on their doorstep, they just started talking about problems in the town centre and things like that. So they were feeling that the area around them was um, getting uh, increasingly safe and, and, and well regulated. And it was about doing this over time. And the critical thing I think um, the critical lesson I take from this is just how important it is to have practical actions 
on the ground. So it's not just saying that we're going to do neighbour policing, it's actually doing it. Um, and it's in solving the issues and problems and frictions that people have on an everyday basis in their neighbourhood that I think starts to take some of the ground and allow more pro-social kind of forces uh, to exert their influence in terms of how people feel about both their neighbourhood, the safety of their families, but also the broader world around them. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Um, excellent. Loads, loads of really interesting thoughts there, which we can, uh, which we can discuss. Um, but I, just before we go to the um, questions that are coming in, I, I thought I'd ask a couple of questions. Um, just uh, a question for Jyoti. Um, you, you talked about technology and um, how this might not be uh, the solution to the problems of trust and confidence. Um, I just wondered if you could say something about, um, you know, I mean, the sort of coming AI revolution and, and what you think the impact of that might be. Um, because on the one hand, because, I mean, you talked about procedural justice. And I guess one of the challenges is, I mean, people will feel that the police are being, um, uh, I think one of the reasons that procedural justice might work sometimes is because, People are talking to a human being, and I guess there's a question in my mind: is can you have procedurally just encounters with um, a chatbot or an AI, some kind of AI um, software? Because it, it feels like that's the direction we're going in. Um, and do you, what do you think about that? Do you think there are there are challenges there in terms of public confidence? I mean, <clears throat> we all know what happens uh, with with the demise of police stations where you can't actually go in and talk to somebody on the front desk and you've got to call a number and give in. And that itself affects the way you think about the police. You don't know who it is you're dealing with. Um, so chatbots are, are, are sort of, yes, they're an answer to 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 the resource crunch. Whether, whether that will further issues of public justice, uh, procedural justice, is definitely a big question. But I was thinking more in terms of police using AI and police using predictive models and pol police using data-led approaches to determine their operational uh, priorities and, and tactical sort of strategies. And that I feel, and being on the policing ethics panel and looking at some of these issues from, from a very ethical perspective. The police are so driven by 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 the um by the notion that you know there's a there's there's this data and this algorithm spits out an answer and tells us who are the most at risk offenders. And and you know that actually takes the onus away from us from having to make biased or um sort of racist decisions or whatever it uh, it might be. There's, 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 as I said, there's a strange reluctance to examine actually what goes into this black box of algorithms because some of them are commercially uh, sort of produced algorithms. Some of them are. We've done some work on on the RFGV algorithm, for example, that is trying to identify most at risk domestic violence perpetrators, and and there's just so much variability across forces in the ways in which these so-called algorithms are applied and, and how the outcomes of those algorithms are then treated by uh, what kind of management processes they are subject to, which actually then takes away the, this illusion that it is it is objective because it's very, very subjective to each police force and, and, and resources that are available to them. So, so it just seems as if you know using technological solutions might be a good way to establish legitimacy and if people think the police are legitimate they'll begin to trust them more um it's probably fallacious i think because because it may or may not lead to outcomes that are fair and just um they're based on data that's police data that we already know there are problems with police data and so it's just perpetuating, if not worsening, some of the inequalities. And it's it's those inequalities that make people mistrust the police a lot, apart from all the other 
sort of issues that Martin was talking about. So, so it is difficult to in 10 minutes sort of analyze the entire problem, but I was sort of looking at it from the organizational justice perspective, basically saying you're treating your own people badly and how are you then expecting them to go out and treat others well? So it's this, this you know, big in reform within the organization before moving outwards. Great, Thank, thanks, Jess. And um, Martin, I, I just had a question for you, which was on, um, uh, and you, I, I think rightly said, you know, these problems aren't new and, and most of these themes are, are themes that have run throughout the history of policing. and. and um, and you talked about misinformation and, and how that goes back a, a long way. Um, but I wondered about, I just wondered about what you think the impact of social media has been on, on all of this, because um, I don't know, it seems to me that social media, I think when social media first came on the scene, I sort of thought that, oh, well, this is just something at the sort of margins of communications and it, and it wouldn't have an effect, but it seems to me, it's actually really permeated our culture and our discourse in a really quite profound way. But I wonder what you think the impact of social media is on, on policing specifically, because it seems to me that you get this speed of um, stories, misinformation going around, which the police then need to respond to and, uh, and all of that. I mean, do you think it's a kind of, uh, it, it may, it, it's, it's, it's a different kind of challenge to some of the challenges we had in the past. You know, how, how different is it um, from the kind of misinformation the police had to deal with in the past? And also, do you have any thoughts about what, what do the police do about that? I mean, in terms of what do they do, uh, you know, in terms of their presence on social media, the way in which they're responding to these things? So just wonder if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I think I would sort of agree with you, Rick, which is to, to some degree, um, social media is um, an accelerant um, for a, a, a lot of these processes. But I, I, I do think we need to sort of kind of nuance it uh, a, a, a degree because um, social media is not one thing and it is also an evolving and adapting um, thing. So there is a danger of um, over-investing in the importance of certain platforms at the current time and underinvesting in um, the the, the um, importance of emerging and, and, and newer platforms. So one of the areas, for example, um, that 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 we've been quite interested in is the rise and growth of TikTok, um, which is a very difficult place for police to engage in any kind of form of strategic communication because of the culture and the uh, the conventions and the affordances of of, of, of that particular platform so i think sort of I, I just start by kind of saying you know it, it kind of it matters what platforms we're talking about in, in, in terms of social media but i would certainly agree it has been profoundly profoundly uh influential um but i think it's been profoundly influential on both sides um so one of the things i've been fascinated with in terms of how how this stuff plays through in policing is both social media is, is both a cause and a challenge of problems so the role of disinformation in riots and and, uh, and other things but equally there is a second strand to it which is social media is transforming how the police can do their work and how they investigate crimes and the whole rise of the open source intelligence um, kind of uh, 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 movement which has been popularised by sort of private agencies such as Bellingcat, but it's also very important in terms of the police and in terms of how they are identifying suspects, crimes and things like that. The ability to collect, process and analyse public data um, for public good, I think is, is really quite important. And, and one of the things I am profoundly interested in is the ways in which this is reshaping how uh, police and others do their investigative work um, within that. And then the third part of your question was, and, and, and what can you do about it? So you can do things about it, but it involves um, um, doing things differently. So just a couple of quick um, stories um, 
uh, that just illustrate how the police can respond to this challenge. So the first um, comes from um, uh, uh, um, a situation that um, I was involved in, 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 in helping the police monitor, which was there were a series of um, public protests taking place in Trafalgar Square, I think it was, or some, somewhere near there, Parliament Square maybe. Um, and within that, there were... Um, and within the wider kind of crowd, there were some agitators there who were trying to stir things up and agitate. And they started messaging on um, on uh, X or Twitter, as it was then. Um, we're being kettled. We're being kettled. Quick, do something, do something. Trying to kind of get a crowd dynamic going. In response to which, the police quickly flew the helicopter over, took a picture of the crowd and jumped on the same hashtags that the agitators were using to send a picture back saying, no, you're not, you are not being kettled. This is not kind of true information. And that just helped kind of keep keep the, uh, the equilibrium a, a bit more. The second story in terms of what you can do about this um, relates to some work that I was doing in the counterterrorism field. So. Um, we used social media to monitor the aftermath of what happened following the tragic murder of Lee Rigby in 2013. And what we were able to see is that because it was new, the police really didn't have a communications strategy to know what to do about this. Um, so as a result, um, far right activists were able to get a lot of airtime and a lot of attention because if you like, the police were saying nothing about it and they just kind of flooded it with all their hashtags and all, all, all their messaging. So we took that finding back to, 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 to the net and to counterterrorism policing. And we said, you know, you can't allow this to happen. Um, and so what you saw when um, the four terrorist attacks happened in 2017 uh, in London and Manchester is a far more proactive on the front foot kind of messaging because they had learned and understood that if you leave and say nothing in these kind of technological spaces, then you kind of give the space over to, 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 the, to the bad actors. Uh, and so you kind of just adjust your messaging um, posture um, in order to be able to say something um, that, that, that just helps keep, keep a, a degree of public reassurance in very difficult moments. Thanks, Martin. Um, Right, I've got two questions. That I thought I'll, I'll put these two questions to you both. And I mean, pick, you can feel free to answer just one of them or, or, or answer both if you, if you wish. But one question we had from uh, David Morgan is how can police and crime commissioners stroke mayors contribute effectively to rebuilding trust in the police? So what, what is the role of uh, police and crime commissioners, mayors in rebuilding public trust and confidence? And then the second question I wanted uh, to put to you was from Eddie Simmons, who's a police officer, who says, um, does there need to be a reform of the IOPC? Officers do not trust that they will be treated fairly by the misconduct process. The public do not think that the misconduct process is effective. Does, does this have an effect on public confidence? Or as an officer, am I putting too much weight on this because of how it affects um, myself and colleagues? So um, what do you think about the role of police and crime commissioners, elected politicians in improving trust and confidence? And what do you think about the IOPC and the complaint system? And, and I guess we could extend that to the misconduct system as a whole and the role that that plays. So if you, I don't know if either of you got any thoughts on, on any of that. Jyoti, uh, yeah. I, I was just, I'm going to let Martin answer the first question. Uh, I'll try and answer the second one. So Martin, you want to go ahead. You can talk about the crime commissioners. I'll talk about the misconduct procedures because I've done some work on um, So I think the the things that um, uh, could be done by elected officials are actually to make clear that this is a priority um, for them amongst a whole host of kind of things. It is that degree of clarity and focus, I think, that elected politicians could bring um, to this debate and appreciate that um, prioritising trust and confidence um, may not necessarily be the same as seeing reductions in crime as they are traditionally measured. So they're not necessarily the, the, the same thing. So I think that's really uh, important 
And I also think um, uh, there is a role here on the accountability kind of strand in terms of um, how the relationship between senior police officers and um, elected uh, uh, officials is transacted in terms of demonstrating that accountability is being had. And accountability, I think, is both in terms of being supportive on the things that are good, but also being robust and challenging on the things that are not going um, so well and helping uh, uh, police and, and um, at, at all different levels to kind of think about the ways in which um, being held to account can help build trust and confidence. Thanks, Mons. Jyoti. That actually leads really nicely into the second question, which is about, about the misconduct uh, processes. And, and I do think one of the one of the biggest chunks of organizational justice is professional standards departments. They can do a lot about how officers feel they've been treated by the organization when there are misconduct um, cases or misconduct uh, investigations. And <clears throat> And again, it's it's a lot. There is there there are lots and lots of issues there. We have done work that looks at misconduct cases uh, and outcomes of misconduct cases, and they do have um, biases within in terms of worse outcomes for people from minority ethnic communities and proportionally worse outcomes for women. Although there are fewer women in the misconduct process. Some earlier work that we did on misconduct uh, among senior police leaders, and this was in, 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 in 2012-13, it indicated that the kinds of things that, that promoted misconduct amongst police, senior police officers, is very much this kind of the culture around um, you know, promoting people in your own image and nobody really challenging authority. And, and it's it's to me, it is all about the internal culture within the organization. And uh, a lot of it is about, um, about how, how important um, things like wetting, things like misconduct are within the organization. And um, it has been, and uh, when we looked at the misconduct outcomes for senior police officers, there were so many of them that that you know sort of copped the system, resigned before um, you know they were asked to move, and they kept all their benefits and things like that. Things that do then in the public perception seem to be very unfair, and again, it it just adds to that um, to that impression that the organisation itself is is corrupt and is problematic. And so so whilst what Whilst it's it's the actions that need to be done, and there are several several really good um, several good suggestions on how the police might actually go about rebuilding trust, it's unless they have a, a, a fundamental mindset change to want to do some of these things, to be more transparent, to be more accountable, to be more just to the people they're dealing with, whether they're internally their own officers or externally. I mean, I, I seem it's not just a one drum that I beat. I just feel it's it's fundamental to everything that stems out of that culture into the actions and behaviors and attitudes of officers. And somehow we we seem to be addressing the symptoms and not the root cause, which is which is problematic. And it's probably too difficult to to assess. So yes, I do think much more transparency in the misconduct process um, would would make a difference to that extent. So it's not it's not it's not just because you're an officer that you're focusing on it. It is quite important. Great, thanks, Josie. Um, and I, I had a question here uh, from Mary Fraser for for Martin, who says, "I wonder what Martin felt about the use of the four E's." by the police engage, explain, encourage, enforce during the COVID pandemic, as HMI CFRS found that one third of 
public respondents found it useful as a way of explaining police actions. So, you know, Martin, that was a question to you on, on the four E's and what you thought of them. Um, I, again, as kind of, I thought they were okay, actually, and, and quite helpful. It's always interesting to me to think about an organisation such as the police um, and how do you mould and change behaviour and actions on the ground. One of the unique qualities that social scientists have long talked about in, in relation to the police is that quite unusual for, for, for most kind of organisations of bureaucracy, the level of discretion increases the lower down the ranks that you go. And that actually kind of creates a very kind of challenging dynamic um, in terms of in situations, how do you steer and guide the behaviour of lots and lots of people over whom you don't necessarily um, you're not necessarily afforded the ability to monitor um, or micro-monitor their behaviours and actions and what it is that they're doing on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment kind of basis. Um, I think the... So in, in, in that sense, I kind of totally understand where, where this kind of thing comes from and I use, I've used similar things in, 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 in work that I've, I've done with the police. I think the problem that comes with these kind of things is when they become a straitjacket or too regimented or they ossify. Um, and um, officers and, and, and other members of staff don't feel comfortable to respond to the requirements of the situation if it doesn't fit within the neat boxes that they feel safe and, and comfortable with. So I think that's kind of one of the challenges I, 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 I just... Uh, put out there um, is 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 there is this kind of dynamic and this tension between using these kind of schemas to to kind of guide and mould and change behaviour that you want to see on the ground, without becoming over invested in them, that they then sort of tip over into becoming detrimental and and and, and kind of uh, overly regulatory uh, in terms of what it is that you want to see. Uh, police officers do responding to situations and traumas um, in, 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 in real life. Thanks, Martin. And Jyoti, I, just, I had a question for you about um, uh, culture, because you talked, you talked about culture change and organisational change. And I just, and uh, this is a very difficult question. I don't expect you to have uh, the answer, because I certainly don't know the answer myself. Um, uh, I mean, where, I, I guess the question with culture, maybe one of the reasons that police, when police leaders think about this, they sort of struggle with it, is they sort of think, where where do you start with that? You know, so, so what, and, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on where you might start with this question of culture change, because on the, like, as everybody, I think, would agree, and one in your big point was, you know, you can't just do, you know, a bit of training here and then expect that to have the result. You need a big kind of shift in the, in the, in the culture of the organisation. Um, where, yeah, where where do you start with trying to get that kind of culture change? What are some of the things that you might start to try and do? So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There is no one size fits all answer or there is indeed no no clear cut answer. But we did some work on um, on a couple of organizations that were trying to to introduce culture change. And we were looking at different models of culture change, the more organic model where where it's it's sort of diffused throughout the organization but it's it's also um a very sort of regimented sort of institutional change in a much larger organization which was very driven by the leadership um i think i think for these things that the the sort of the desire for culture change needs to come from from improving some of the internal culture organizations, starting off with promotion policies and, and, and misconduct policies and, you know, identifying. And, and what we found was really interesting. So, so some of this work has been done in the UK in some of the forces and, and in some police organizations in the US. And, and we found it was easier in smaller organizations where, which were sort of quite, quite dramatically 
um, led by these these charismatic leaders who could bring about a change. And if they had a long enough tenure, you know, the the the, the desire for change and the whole the momentum was enough so that even when there was a leadership change, the momentum kept the organizational justice project going forward. Um, whereas in the in the much larger UK organization, it was it was very much leadership driven. There were structures. It was all very organized. But but when when there was a pressure on policing resources, all those resources that had been set up to drive forward the organizational justice um, agenda was quickly reallocated, and and immediately there was a there was a sort of a breakdown, and it wasn't flavor of the month anymore. So. You know, it's it has to be it has to be leadership driven, I feel. But but whether it depends upon the organization, the size and the culture already existing within the organization, whether it needs to be very structured or whether it could be more organic. And there is no sort of one solution. But but I do think it comes from 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 personally, I think it should come with the desire and the leadership to want, which unfortunately now seems to be very technologically focused. So yeah, we have a problem, but you know what, let's just drive through data-driven uh, solutions and that'll somehow magically address our problems. And uh, that's, that's sort of my biggest grouse with what's going on, not the fact that they are being more data-driven. That's absolutely um, probably the right thing to do. But it's not the solution to the problem they are trying to apply it to. Great, excellent. Thanks so much, Josie. And that we've we've now run out of time. Um, so um, thank you very much to both Josie and to Martin for their really insightful contributions. Thanks to you all for attending and asking questions. Um, there will be a recording of the session available in due course via the Election Twenty Four Online Hub. Um, uh, we want to uh, we want these sessions to promote uh, discussion beyond just today. So please do share your thoughts on social media and with friends and colleagues. And if you've enjoyed the conversation, please do look out for future events and webinars uh, in this series and register to join us. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.